Welcome back to another week on the Jolly Swagman Podcast. I'm Angus. And I'm Joe. We just finished our interview with Pete Evans, host of or co-host of My Kitchen Rules and big proponent of the paleo diet. Pete got his starts when he and his brother started Hugo's, a very famous restaurant in Bondi. I think the Bondi one's now closed, but there's a big one in Manly. And he's worked in the hospitality industry for years. He's very well known as a judge on My Kitchen Rules. Yep. A massive show Charles. in Australia, big cooking show in Australia. and One of the biggest shows on free to TV and he's been doing that since 2010 and, of course, very well known for his views on the paleo diet. Yeah. Very outspoken about how we, our modern diet, he's, he's really big about stripping away all those processed sugars, processed foods and getting back to you know stuff that comes out of the ground and off the trees, basically. This conversation was... Uh, yeah. It wasn't what I was expecting. No. I thought Pete was going to be giving us diet advice, but he was more of a philosopher. Yeah, and I think he's he's maybe he's I, I don't know. I don't want to speak for Pete, but maybe he's learnt not to be too prescriptive in what he says in public because he gets beaten down a lot by the mainstream media who kind of misquote him and basically cherry pick his comments really for clickbait headlines yeah, and sort of bait him he was uh, a lot yeah, very philosophical i um, mean a lot of you know his outlook on life and how he eats and what he eats is really just a, com- a component of that that overall we call the zen outlook it was a uh, interesting chat definite takeaways for the listeners yeah absolutely i think what everyone can get from this specifically is basically a good template or formula for a healthy diet uh, and, and please and healthy life as and healthy well. yeah please give this a uh, serious consideration basically cut out all refined carbs that includes bread rice cereal mm. etc mm. dairy <laughs> cut out sugar yep. uh, cut out most dairy i think some dairy in moderation is okay yeah. pete, pete doesn't eat dairy but um the odd bit of feta on your salad is fine it's also and delicious so. it, do, it does yeah. taste very good at times but uh and just focus on real food meat vegetables healthy fat like avocado nuts olive oil and then you're you're laughing please give us some feedback on this pod would love to hear your comments and thoughts so itunes always and online just hit us up on all the socials if you want to get in contact and uh without much further ado please enjoy our chat with pete evans From Swagman Media, this is the Jolly Swagman Podcast. Here are your hosts, Angus and Joe. Pete, how are you? Awesome. Thanks for having me on your podcast, fellas. Pleasure. Thanks Great for to have you. So, we were doing some research in preparation for this podcast and it just seems like you get absolutely pilloried by different publications. <laughs> What's the deal with that? Uh, it would depend on where you look, I guess. Yeah. Uh, if you're looking into mainstream media, then there's definitely some, uh, I guess, some, some articles out there that um, have been made up, mm-hmm. I would say, uh, based on lies or untruths. So uh, I'd always recommend people get a good understanding of someone either by talking to them first and foremost mm-hmm. or actually going to the source and, and looking at, either their own website or social media or the work that they're doing. So over the last few years, I've been um, quite um, happy to push out some information that is, I guess, um, that comes from some of the world's leading doctors, nutritionalists, scientists, and in that process, help to spread some words mm. on some simple truths to actually um, improving people's lives. So the... L- the avenues that I've had to use have been podcasts like what we're doing now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've cre- created a documentary called The Magic Pill, uh, which has just been picked up by Netflix, which is great. Oh, cool. Um, two series of the Paleo Way TV series as well, which is on iTunes and uh, Amazon, and as well as releasing, I think, well, I think I'm up to 20 cookbooks now. Oh, and, really? uh, so that's just a, a way of communicating a direct to the user pretty much so i guess where you've uh, googled me or or come yeah. up with those I some guess. of the headlines were pretty snug yeah. it's um <laughs> if, you, if you search your name i thought far out like i thought i knew pete evans but f- like there's some but absolute in, crap out there in fairness to 
a lot of it I could tell was taken out of context. Yeah. For example, there was the sunscreen thing and the headline essentially was Pete Evans says sunscreen is poisonous, but that would lead – I could understand how that would lead the average reader to think Pete Evans says not to use sunscreen and, you know, he, he doesn't think that melanoma is a problem. But actually you do use sunscreen but you just use a healthy brand. Am I right? Uh, to a degree. Okay. Yes and no. Okay. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Let, let's unpack that. <laughs> well, again, if you go back to the source, what I it was a question and answer that I do on my social media and someone said, what do you use? And I said, well, to be honest with you, hardly nothing um, because most sunscreens do have toxic ingredients mm. in them that I would not put on myself or my children or no one should be putting that stuff on them, in my opinion. Um, but I said, if I do go out for long periods of time... Uh, like I was when the question was answered. I was surfing in Fiji. It was midday, three hours surfing. I'm going to put some zinc on and right? wear a hat mm. or a T-shirt and stuff like that. So the zinc that I chose to use was a non-toxic one. So that's what I said. And then next day it turns into headline, Pete says, don't wear sunscreen. Do, do you have a, like a favourite untruth that you've heard over the years, something you've been flicking through and just mm. thought, far out, where do they come up with that? <laughs> uh, what is the one? Uh, the... F- the f- I guess the strangest one is the fake tan. I think a lot of people say that. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you do have a very a healthy tan here. Is, is it fake or real? We should. Uh... No, it's it's a hundred percent real. El natural, baby. Well, credit. So far, <laughs> yeah, I use the uh, the free mechanism, which is the sun, yeah. Yeah. to go out. And uh, if you do a little bit of research as well, uh, there's a wonderful book called The Healing Sun by Michael Hobday. And once you start to go down some of these rabbit holes, uh, you will understand that um, we're so disconnected from our true selves and our true identity in this modern world, especially a world that is, um, I guess, if you follow mainstream media, they prey or base their uh, their information sharing on sensational headlines and untruths and division mm. and also fear. And I think fear is a, a wonderful topic to explore. So fear of this, that, or the other, uh, you will get people reading and uh, and buying and consuming and uh, being worried. So. It's been a, um, an interesting journey to see both sides of, of how this works. So, again, I'll go back to where do you get your information from? So, if you wanted to know about the sun and its healing properties, then there's books out there or people out there that study it. So, for once, The Healing Sun uh, by um, uh, Hobday. And from that, you can ascertain that we actually need vitamin D. Mm-hmm. We are animals, first and foremost. We're human beings. We've always been outside. We've always been exposed to the elements and to the sun. And why do we have such a chronic amount of vitamin D deficiency in our modern world? Mm. So I read through the research, I speak to the experts, and they suggest we what? should be out in the sun absorbing what we're meant to be doing. So. I practice that each and every day wherever I can. Yeah, and what, what, so what sort of criteria do you use when you're selecting which, which books or which experts or which papers to go with? The ones that make common sense. Okay, so you, you, <laughs> use, you use like the common sense rule of thumb. I think we all have to. I think once you uh, f- forget about common sense or, or try to outsmart common sense, mm. which have so many people try to do, is where you start to fall into a huge trap and I guess back to what I said before is we're human beings we're animals now if you look at what a human being where we've come from how we've evolved where we are now are we in decline as far as mental clarity goes physical health Mm. uh, environmental health all of these factors what does it mean to be human in 2018 and can we look back through our evolutionary history and take some advice or some common sense views of when was there a time when we didn't suffer from mental health? Has that been documented? Yes, it has. Okay, so what were those people doing? Who studied these people? Okay, this person studied it. What did they study? Okay, if you look at, uh, say, someone like Dr. Weston A. Price, who studied Indigenous communities around the world, 
human indigenous communities around the world, he found out that the health of these people in all these different parts of the world, they didn't have mental illness, they didn't have cancer, they didn't have type 2 diabetes, they didn't have stress like we have stress today. They had different stresses, but it didn't manifest in the way that it is for us. So does a lot of that have to do with community living? Uh, well, you can take that all into... As uh, part of the package. As part of the package. So again, going back to what does it mean to be human? Okay, simple. We need to breathe. So do we need to breathe clean air or polluted air? Number two, we need to drink. What have we evolved to drink? Number one would be water, correct? Clean water. Where do we find clean water in modern day society now? I mean, it isn't coming out of your taps in Sydney, that's for sure. It isn't coming out of your taps in Melbourne. It might be clean, but is it pure? Is it the best possible source of water that we've evolved to drink? So we've looked at breath, we've looked at uh, water. What else is there? Vitamin D, sun exposure. Let's have a look at that. How were we doing it properly once when we didn't get skin cancers? Let's have a look at what else do we mean to be human. Let's look at our diet. Are we eating a diet that supports us in modern day society that is based on evolutionary history of what it means to be a human being? Or are we trying to outsmart ourselves and get something quick and packaged and this, that, or the other? And then you can look at community. How were we raised in environments with our community, in our tribe, in our social structure? What were the roles of the people in that family or community structure? And, and did they have purpose? Did they have a job to fulfill? Was how much play did they have as a human being? You look at, I mean, all you've got to do is look at animals and look at how much they play and how much uh, when they're not governed by, I guess, modern day living. So all of these things, movement comes into play as well. How did we move as a species to be where we are without hurting ourselves. And all you need to do is look at the gyms that are popping up and even crossing the road here, I saw that there's gyms on every corner. Now, is any of that normal? Does any of that service to be functional human beings? I see so many people torturing themselves trying to do a gym workout. I go, how has that ever been a part of who we are? And it's, so coming back to where do you get your research from is you take a common sense viewpoint of our evolutionary history and some things, of course, we have improved upon, whether it is cleanliness or sanitation or medicine or whatever it may be. But once we delve back into looking at our evolutionary history, we should be able to take markers and cues from all of those different things, food, di or diet, water, movement, breath, uh, how to live in a community, as well as sleeping. Should we be under artificial lights of a night time? Or should we be going to bed a bit earlier, waking up with the sun, working out our cortisol levels? All of these things are pretty common sense once you dig down a little bit deeper, if anyone takes the, has the, uh, I guess, the, the notion has to look into it. How do you reconcile how we've changed our lives to, you know, live under lights at night and drink water that isn't specifically pure? And I mean, there, there are a lot of differences from how we lived going back, however far you want to go back. But we also, you know, live a lot longer now. We live in a different mm. world. We can't sort of get by with not going to work, sitting at a desk, driving to work, whatever you're living in a city. So, so what do you say... Um, we live longer now. Yeah, on average, say. So we Are we living better lives on average? Are we well, living more fulfilled lives? Are we living more loving lives? Are we living more healthy lives? Or are we just around a little bit longer? Mm. I mean, this well, yeah, I mean, because in times past, the you know, everyone knows that, that statistic, like the average human lifespan was 40 years old. Yeah. Well, that's but based that on was actually skewed a lot by infant mortality. Yeah. Death and childbirth. So if you got past all the dangers of childhood, say in the Middle Ages, you could actually expect to live a pretty long and you would also happy. have pretty bad teeth though, right? And have like rotting mm, rotting well, teeth. No, and again, stuff. if you, you go back to depends. the fellow that I just mentioned, Weston A. Price, who's who studied indigenous tribes, 
They had perfect teeth. Mm. They had perfect bone structure or jaw structure. The Egyptians and the Romans had terrible teeth, but they used to grind their grain with sand. So a lot of the bread that the Romans ate and the Egyptians ate was contaminated with sand and it used to just grind their teeth right. down. You'd have to go a little bit deeper. You could have a look at some of the work by um, the fellow that uh, wrote a book called Protein Power and um, his name skips me at the moment, but uh, he's got a wonderful uh, YouTube video that you can search up and... Um, so if you look at the author of Protein Power, you look at some of his videos, the one from Low Carb Down Under and Vale uh, from two years ago, he does a whole talk for an hour on the Egyptian diet. Yeah. And you'd be uh, amazed at uh, what is actually in there. How do you reconcile these, I mean, strongly held beliefs that you have with sort of what you see day to day in your profession even? Um, and you, Most people would know you from like My Kitchen Rules and a lot of the food... I. I've got to admit, I don't, I don't watch it. But a lot of the food I see on the ads that come out, you know, don't subscribe to a lot of these things. Yeah. And a lot of people watch that show and, you know, recreate the recipes and everything. And do, is there a bit of a, 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 a tension within you about do going you have, on this show? Do you have like a spittoon beside yeah. the table? <laughs> uh, to answer your question, Joe, for the 500th time probably, <laughs> no, I do not have a spittoon. I, I enjoy the food that is cooked mostly, yeah. <laughs> unless if it's under-seasoned or overcooked. Yeah, God forbid. Um, but it makes up – so we're talking about My Kitchen Rules yeah. for anyone that's not uh, – Because, that, I mean, that, that's the obvious thing that comes to mind, your work on My Kitchen Rules and then your sort of personal sure. views, right? So um, my work on My Kitchen Rules is, is fantastic. I get to work with a, a wonderful bunch of people that are very close friends mm. – uh, Manu and Colin, who are fellow judges, we've known each other for a long time and you know what it's like when you work with people that you like to work with? It's a, it's a joy to go to work. Oh, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and we've been doing this show now for nine years, coming into its 10th season. It's uh, been very successful for not only the network, but it's also been successful for the people that take part in it. And... We have this wonderful, I guess, moment in history over the last 10 years where we've had shows like My Kitchen Rules and MasterChef. We've had Jamie Oliver. We've had the Gordon Ramsays. We've had this fascination about food, right? And in Australia over the last five years, MasterChef and My Kitchen Rules have both been the number one television programs in Australia, free-to-air, primetime television, celebrating food. Now, who would have thought that in this day and age that that would ever be such a, uh, such a wonderful thing for popular culture to have as a vehicle for the coming generations? So I just came out of a meeting from the Southern Highlands today where I just signed a book for a young girl who's nine. And she sent me the most wonderful letter uh, through her father about that uh, she just loves cooking. Now, there have been countless, you know, hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands of kids that I've met that have an appreciation for food because of the programs that we're on. So for me, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to be a part of something that is changing people's lives. And I, I've said it before and I'll say it again, the power of food in, or the celebration of food on mainstream television is that these kids that are nine and 10 now, or even the ones that have, in their teenage years that have grown up with this, these are the people that will be making the decisions of the future of how do we shop? How do we farm? What do we base our decisions on to feed our families? I mean, I grew up in a, in a family that had, um, that was separated, but I also had a mum that loved to cook and she cooked basic food, but on the dinner table or the breakfast table were foods that didn't serve me as far as my health goes. And I suffered from ill health from it as a child. So now you go into the supermarket, there's coconut yogurts, 
There's dairy-free options. There is grass-fed organic meats available. There is organic vegetables available. We're part of this communication or this story at this particular time in history where we have the coming generation that is fascinated about food. We have up-to-date information about what food does to our body for anyone that's interested in, in discovering a little bit more. And to go back to your question about the conflict or the unease of me being on my kitchen rules, it makes up one to two percent of my yearly diet. Where prior to discovering the stuff that I know about food, I would be this would be a hundred percent of my yearly so diet. It's really about moderation is like kind of mm. a or not moderation but unequal servings then ninety eight percent how you think we should be eating and then that one or two percent on my kitchen rules? I've never told anybody how they should be eating, but my choice is how to I eat yeah. is I choose to do my kitchen rules, I choose to eat the food that's served to me, I choose to be in that position mm. as the host because I want to be. And the other 98 to 99% of my diet, I also choose. So my choices should not influence anybody else's choices. You should do what makes you happy. You know, I'm never going to judge somebody for, for not eating how I eat. And, you know, maybe people don't need to judge me for the food that I eat on my kitchen rules because we all have free will. And my free will is to choose whatever it is that makes me happy. And my role in my kitchen rules, apart from the fact that I actually enjoy it, is that it is also a wonderful platform to be able to share recipes through my cookbooks or podcasts or for have people interested because they might go, you know, what is it with this guy? He <laughs> promotes this thing, but he's on here. Let's have a look. They might go onto social media and learn some more stuff about mm -hmm. things. I don't know. But again, I don't really think about it that much. I just, it's a, it's a job that I like to do. I actually want to go back to where we were heading before we started talking about MKR and we were talking about how you use common sense as a rule of thumb for deciding which experts or you know books to go with yep. to form your beliefs. I, I actually agree with you a lot that we should be skeptical of so-called experts some of the time. Like we should just take that as an approach towards expert opinion because there have been many occasions when <laughs> the expert opinion has just been totally wrong. Like for a long time, uh, physicists had the completely wrong picture of the universe before we discovered the Big Bang Theory. And I think, I'm sure, I, I know you agree, Pete, but probably one of the worst abuses that expert opinion has perpetrated on society in recent decades is, you know, the so-called food pyramid that we were fed for so long and the belief that uh, fat was the enemy and carbs were okay. Like that was sort of the standard textbook of dietitian societies and health organizations around the world for a long time but we've recently discovered that it's completely the reverse of what we we're being told but i mean so on on the other hand though i mean there are times when you should also be skeptical of common sense like human common sense in millennia past would have told us that you know the the earth was flat that we were the center of the universe and there's something called the naturalistic fallacy which is like you can't just assume that because something is is natural it's good like natural doesn't equal good um for example like smallpox is that the disease we eradicated in the 20th century so we, when we eradicate it so smallpox is is obviously naturally occurring in the environment but through science and modern science and human ingenuity were able to eradicate it through vaccination and that's literally led to the saving of millions of lives but what i'm trying to say is like i i'm very skeptical of so-called expert opinions but i'm also skeptical of of common sense you, you, you can't, can't really just have one or the you other you can't be ideological mm. one way or the other well you would then uh as i just released a documentary called the magic pill mm-hmm so in that, we'll go back to where you were talking about, Joe, where that you were talking about the, the fallacy of the, uh, the modern-day food pyramid. Yes. So through that, we, there was a lady called Nina Tischoltz who wrote a book called The Big Fat Surprise, talking about fats and mm. carbohydrates. So um, she spent 10 years basically 
uh, documenting and working and writing this book and gathering the research as to how the guidelines came to be. And there was another fellow called Gary Torbs as well, who I've interviewed, um, who also wrote, uh, has written quite a few books over in the States about how these guidelines came to be. Now, we're lucky enough to be able to share that information through the documentary, but the mainstream audience or the or mass public is still unaware of how those guidelines came to be. So when you talk about experts, it is vitally important that... How do we do... How do I say this? I like experts that get results. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Common sense is important, of course, but common sense to actually speak to the experts and say, so what's your percentage rating? How, how many people are you healing? How many people are getting better doing what you're promoting? So I spoke, I did an interview last two weeks ago with a fellow called uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who wrote a book called The End of Alzheimer's. So here's his take. He says 99.6% of the drugs and common medical um, service or explanation or treatment, I should say, of Alzheimer's fails. Whereas him, in clinical trials, he is up to a 90% success rate of reversing um, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's dementia. And he is doing it through the simple common sense viewpoints that we discussed earlier. So like paleo diet? He promotes a non-inflammatory diet, uh, which is, I guess, what Similar, you would call a, a paleo approach, but it also t takes into factors of different types of uh, the package, so to speak. So but his, his stuff been peer reviewed and tested and... Well, who's peer reviewing? And if you want to go back into... Uh, the expert side of things. You should be very careful of how peer reviewing works. But um, because also there's... I know it's not foolproof. Yeah, but, but it is. It's a pretty good It's filter. as good as we've got, isn't yeah. it? I'm just... Because, I'm, I mean, that, that, those results are fantastic, right? Fantastic. But I'm just yeah. wondering how, again, we can't just rely on that, that one person's, um, you know, what he's espousing as the, the cure. Like if someone else can corroborate and... Try well, to prove he's, it false and he's released his yeah. his research. So if you want to have a look at that, then you can we can check link it to out. It. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. absolutely. So Dr. Dale Bredesen, the Alzheimer's, um, the end of Alzheimer's, is his book. But you speak to someone like that, and these people are getting results. You speak to someone else that deals with type two diabetes, that is promoting a lower carb, healthy fat approach, and they're having a nine again, and nine out of ten times they can reverse type 2 diabetes mm. and I've had interviews with people before and they've said that is impossible mm. but one of our guests early guests Michael Mosley I did I think did that he himself is a, a BBC um, he's a doctor he's on the BBC as a, as a host and everything and he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes fasted for I think 10 days and has pretty much eliminated a lot of the side effects yeah. from that I know he also pointed to studies that showed that Intermittent fasting prevented Alzheimer's in yeah. rats. Um, well, that's what interesting. But I wasn't aware that um, paleo-style diets could actually. Mm. Are you saying that they could reverse the effects of Alzheimer's or just prevent? One hundred percent, as Dale Bredesen says, one hundred percent prevent, and okay. ninety percent in his studies so far. Uh, and I'm I'm just. Uh, quoting here so mm -hmm. yeah, um, sure. but read the book and and it's all there or listen to the podcast yeah. that we just did uh yes but uh reverse Unbelievable. Or, and stop that's pretty magical that's big it's yeah. true i mean huge yeah <laughs> but, well if you think about it in australia we have one it's, it's one an absolute ep epidemic right yeah. we have one and a half million mother with alzheimer's mm. well we have one and a half million people with type 2 diabetes that basically could all be reversed mm. within a matter of months I, and for free. Yeah. Is, is, is that is that yeah. why is that is that last point there for free? Why it's not being sort of talked about more because you can't <laughs> make money out of something if you sell it for free? <laughs> is that why is there is that why there's resistance? Would you think? Well, you'd have to speak to the the 
people like at the medical association and things a, like that. There's a bias in medicine towards action. Yeah. Especially on the legal conditions of medical negligence. Like I think just as a broad point, this is fair to say. Yeah. If, if you, you go, go to a doctor, a doctor they're going to try to fix you, aren't they? They're less likely to get sued if they offer the standard prescription. But if they, Nassim Taleb in any fragile, calls it via negativa. Um, if they just sit on the hands. Like subtracting. It, like modern life is more about adding stuff, adding cures. But, you know, if, if doctors were to start subtracting stuff, just saying, just stop yeah. doing what you're doing. <laughs> Are they curing though? You just said the word cure. Well, no, no, that's the point. But I mean, the, what what they what they tend to do is is here's your medication, here are your prescriptions. But there's a bias towards action rather than just towards saying you should stop doing these things. Well, that, and again, get better. It comes down to a choice. What doctor are you going to see? Are you going to see a regular doctor, or are you going to find one that's getting results? So how do you how do you do that at a personal level? Like find doctors gps who get results well, you, or we live in a fascinating world a, a wonderful point in history where we have social media we have facebook pages we have instagram we have word of mouth we have community groups we have people that share information so for instance if you have type 2 diabetes you definitely can find people that have reversed it and find out how they've done it there are doctors out there that are promoting a low carbohydrate, healthy fat approach that are getting results. So there's books out there. I mean, there shouldn't be any reason that people cannot get the information they need, and it's free. It's on the internet, and you just have to talk to the right people, you know. And and again, go back to what are we? We're human beings. What foods have helped us what activities have helped us what living circumstances and environments and relationships have helped us what are those things what is out of balance in my life at this particular point in time that has led me to either have an autoimmune issue type 2 diabetes dementia alzheimer might be a bit difficult to to uh, get to the pinpoint of that at that particular age group um but once we start looking at our life and actually being self-aware of the choices that we've all made choices to be where we are today. I've made a choice to make it here to this podcast. You guys have made a choice to invite me. The listeners have made a choice to listen or not. So everything can be tracked back to our choices up until whatever it is. Mm. And from those choices, we have the answer. Okay, so... I'm overweight or I've got type 2 diabetes or I'm sick or I've got this, where can I trace it back that I'm out of balance? What can I look at in my waking life now and my sleeping life and my consciousness that may be out of balance? Let's start with the basics. Sleep, emotional well-being, diet, water, activity, sunlight. So as far as diet's concerned, just to bring everyone up to speed who mightn't be familiar with your your views in that area. But the diet and the lifestyle that you choose for yourself, do you still use the label paleo? No, I used to use the word <laughs> good food. So okay. if you look at, again, we'll go back to the definition of who we are. We're human beings. We're omnivores, which means we eat both plant and animal food. Mm -hmm. And if you look at over the span of our evolutionary history, what has supported us the most so that we haven't been uh, sick from modern day illnesses, you will notice that we have consumed healthy animal fats, we've consumed animals, mm. flesh, as well as hunting and gathering, I mean gathering. So we're hunter-gatherers. And if you look back through the history, and I recommend a good book for people to read if they want to learn more about this, is a book by Nora Gadgaudis called Primal Body, Primal Mind, because it tracks our evolutionary history through the ice ages and what it was to be human through those periods and what sustained us for our health. And then she combines that with uh, the latest longevity research, and there we have uh, basically an anti-inflammatory diet that is suited, suitable for humans. Can you unpack that anti-inflammatory? I 
Foods. Also, is that, that the label you use now? Anti-inflammatory diet. I like. Do you I, shy away from paleo? Not at all. Okay. I think pa- do you paleo say, means old. Yeah, I mean, that's pa- old. Paleolithic. Yeah. yeah, paleo means old. Yeah, from so it's as simple as is that. Is that what like I'm just trying to work out like definitionally? Definition of paleo is an anti-inflammatory diet that's mm-hmm. based around foods that don't cause inflammation in our bodies. It's based on a low carbohydrate, healthy fat approach, which includes animals. And vegetables, okay. and of course fruits. If you put that under the vegetables, um, so with, cutting out refined carbs like bread, rice, cereal. It's about taking away the foods that cause inflammation to our bodies. Now, the three most common forms of or types of food uh, that cause inflammation for humans is dairy, mm-hmm. grains, and legumes. Obviously, we're all bio individual, so it means we all different so and what our uh, gut makeup is is vastly dependent on the health of our parents okay so some people cannot tolerate eggs for instance they can't tolerate nuts and seeds they have anaphylactic reactions but they also can cause inflammation other people nightshades are highly inflammatory for them so nightshades tomatoes eggplants potatoes capsicums chilies uh, these types of things and that's called an auto so if you have autoimmune issues then you remove those inflammatory foods from your diet as well so basically what you're left with is meat seafood poultry game eggs if you can tolerate them and vegetables and fruits mm-hmm. So that is basically a very simple anti-inflammatory diet for human beings. Now, some people can tolerate other things better than other people, but by and large, if you take out dairy, grains and legumes and eat meat and vegetables or seafood and vegetables, you are on the path to health and wellness. Mm. And if you and combine it, that with a little bit of intermittent fasting, it can work wonders. Well, Are you for intermittent fasting? Yeah, you, well, intermittent fasting becomes the normal when you eat this way. So by default, like today I haven't eaten one thing and it's four o'clock in the afternoon. Is, is that a conscious effort or is the opportunity didn't arise because there weren't those Gen- food groups around so you just don't? Generally, I eat one to two meals a day. It, and morning, night, what's your... Generally, it's like lunchtime okay. or understand. afternoon. How is intermittent fasting necessarily a result of an anti-inflammatory diet? Because when you think about, okay, so when you are eating a standard Australian diet or American diet, uh, generally it's about 60 to 70% carbs, right? So the best analogy, and I'll go back to my friend Nora Gigaudis, she uses the, the analogy of that we can burn fat for fuel or carbs for fuel, where Uniquely designed as human beings that we can use both. We use one a hell of a lot better than the other. Now, the one that we use better is burning fat for fuel. Now, the analogy is if we think about our our metabolic fire that keeps us going, is if we use the analogy of burning kindling to keep our fires going, that would be the same as eating carbs to keep ourselves going. So... The standard Australian diet, based on the food pyramid and what our dietary organisations recommend, is we start off with some cereal or toast in the morning, right? Which, if we convert that into what they are, that's carbohydrates. Now, when that goes into our body, we're burning kindling, right? Very quick energy, but what that is, is high sugar into our bloodstream, which jacks us up, but then we crash. Okay, so if you think about our blood sugar levels once we're eating that for breakfast, two hours later you're hungry again. Mid-morning till morning tea comes around, we're hungry again. So people are grabbing for a, a, a muesli bar or some croissant or whatever, muffins are going around the office, that's what they eat. Lunchtime comes around these days and in the modern world we're eating sandwiches, wraps, sushi, whatever it is, and again, it's carb-based. So we've had breakfast, morning tea, lunch, all carb-based, you try to find me a big plate of vegetables and meat in there or seafood, you're going to be hard-pressed in the standard Australian diet to find that. Afternoon comes, we have the three o'clock slump, people are reaching for chocolate, whatever it is, to keep them going, cookies. Again, carbohydrates. Dinner time comes in uh, modern-day society in Australia and we're pasta loading, we're carb loading, whatever it may be, or you might be lucky enough to have a roast dinner. 
right? Yeah. Standard meat and three veg, which is generally basically what paleo is, is meat and three veg diet. Mm. Obviously a lower carbohydrate, you take out the, the potatoes because they're highly starchy. Can, we, can you leave sweet potatoes? You can have sweet potatoes, yeah. So I've just given you the definition of running your body on kindling as your source of fuel to keep your metabolic fire going. Now there is an alternative to that, and that is to put a big log on the fire and let it burn slowly. Now that fat log basically comes in the form of a non-anti-inflammatory diet, lots of fat, good well-sourced protein and low carbohydrate vegetables or, or a colorful array of vegetables. Really, really simple. So once you start to eat this way, you no longer have the up and down blood sugar rushes, mm -hmm. which those blood sugar rushes make you hungry. Okay, and what have we got at the moment in popular culture is we, we're overeating, we're overeating the wrong foods, and going back to 20 minutes ago, we were talking about type 2 diabetes, which is a form of uh, insulin resistance. Uh, and also, if you look in Australia at the moment, we have half a million women with PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is also related to insulin resistance. So, again, we have a large portion of the society that has major health issues and the major source of this, one of them is a poor diet that is high, high, based in high carbohydrate eating. Um, so going back to your question, by default, you, when you eat this way, as we're talking mm -hmm. about, you actually don't get hungry. Got so it. it's not really a conscious effort because you wake up and you're not hungry. So you just go about your business and do whatever you want to do. And then usually lunchtime comes around and you're like, well, maybe I'll have something to eat. Mm. But what you'll eat is real food, which will sustain you and be that big fat log on the fire. Mm. How do you sort of manage that? that dietary intake when you're rushing around, you're driving from the Southern Highlands back to Sydney, you, you just uh, don't eat or? I didn't eat. Yeah, right. Okay. Because so, I'd imagine whether, whatever diet even... it is, what, I mean, you know, I mean, you, of course you're not hungry, but uh, like whatever diet it is, most people, I guess, fall down when they just don't have their specific diet, dietary foods around them, right? And they just grab a snack or something. So I guess if you're doing this. That, that comes down to a choice. Again, choice is sure, but I guess all humans are pretty fallible beings. Well, that's an opinion. You don't think we're inherently I think, I think <laughs> infallible? I, I, actually, I think that um, it's easier to change your in environment than to force yourself to be really disciplined. But I you're obviously at the point now where it's become such a habit. Yeah. I don't see it as discipline. I don't see it as forcing anything. To be no, I know, but not not anymore. But maybe for someone starting out who is coming off a really bad diet, it would take that initial willpower. It's like yeah, the, the temptations would be. I think all willpower, around, is, wouldn't it? willpower is a bit of a weak weak word. I think it just comes down to, again, if we look at the package of us as a human being, is we have a we have a free will to choose whatever we want at any particular point in time, and. It depends on your inner dialogue, what you want to achieve in your life. Do you love yourself? Uh, do you go, I'll go back, are we basing ourselves around with fear? Do we have fear around what we're reading or what we're seeing on social media? Are we having fear on what we're seeing on television? Have we got fear on what we're getting from uh, newspapers or magazines? Do we have fear from our friends on their opinion of us? Do we have fear that we've... Uh, uh, adopted or inherited from our ch childhood and upbringing, our family structure, our societal structure, our environment. I mean, are we using excuses as we're fallible not to make decisions that better serve us? I mean, these are all questions that, again, you might want to ask yourself because if there's anything out of balance, it's going to show up be th generally through fear. I have a great friend called Rudy Eckhart. Uh, he practices here in Sydney. Uh, he's written a book called The Truth of Love and Fear. And as he states, every decision we make is either based around fear or love. And you can bring that to yourself. Do we love ourselves or do we fear ourselves? 
So many people have the, the fear of their potential. So they make excuses as to why they, they have fear of their family. What are they going to think? They have fear of their friends. Oh, I'm not going to get pissed with you tonight. What do you mean you're not going to get pissed with us? That's what we do. That's how we communicate. You let your guard down, I let my guard down when we, we talk shit for a little while. Or we can sit down and not drink and maybe have a cup of tea and uh, talk about something that... Uh, in a sober point of view, and Getting. maybe talk about fears or love or communication or these type of things. So, again, what is the society that we live in? What is out of balance at the moment? And I'll bring up alcohol because I see it as a huge, huge uh, topic for conversation because in Australian culture, it is standard for us to revolve mm. everything Definitely. around alcohol. You should our just sporting you should have been at our Christmas party last year. <laughs> <laughs> our sporting events, once we celebrate, there's the bottle of champagne. Yeah. You look at that and you wonder. It's tough. Okay, so here's a drug that poisons us that is celebrated. And if we choose not to partake in our Australian culture, it seemed un Australian. Mm. So, but is it unhuman? What has, what has defined us to be associated with a country or a place or a, or a religion or a whatever it may be, when going back to it, let's just go back to what's the beverage we should be drinking for optimal health? What's the beverage we should be having? Kombucha. <laughs> <laughs> Do you drink kombucha? Potentially that might be a supplemental drink that you could add if your gut bacteria isn't great. Okay. So, but once upon a time, would you have needed to have kombucha in your diet? No, not really. Because your gut bacteria probably was... was what so about okay. organic red wine? Do you drink that? <laughs> Again, what's the question? I'd have to ask, why does it matter if I drink red wine? Well, well, if it's organic get, or not. I'm just trying to get tips for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do, do, you, do you drink? Don't the, tan for, the tannins, are they toxic? Or? My, my advice with any... Uh, recreational drug is to uh, number one work out why you want to take it and number two what does it what does it do for you um, what are the outcomes you know is it a social mechanism does it does it help you overcome certain things um, and if so why does why is that the answer why is not something else? So could the answer, you're very Zen people. Yeah, like, you're was, like a monk. It's very um, <laughs> philosophical. <laughs> so what if the answer is just that it, it just tastes nice? So I like to have a glass. Then fantastic. I'm yeah, cool. not here to judge you. Do, do you drink? Um, do you drink uh, yourself? No, no. Co coffee or stimulants or anything? Just a tea man. Well, my wife makes a um, beautiful um, tea, as tea most mornings. We have it. It's a, a wonderful ceremony or experience that goes for half an hour, 45 minutes, and uh, we sit down, sunrise comes, she makes a beautiful tea. Uh, it's in silence for the first couple of bowls. What kind of tea? It's, uh, it depends. It's um, a classic black tea from either Taiwan or China, and uh, it's a wonderful experience, wonderful way to wake up. It's and um, Yeah. I just want to say, so I'm a bit out of shape at the moment, granted, but I'm getting back on track. You've inspired me. But in 2016, a mate of mine, Daniel Gauchi, shout out to Daniel and I, did like a three to four month paleo challenge, living in Canberra at the time. We called it a paleo challenge. All our friends knew about it. We copped a bit of flack for the first couple of weeks, but we, we, I, I sort of combined it with some intermittent fasting as well, but I've never felt better or happier, or, or leaner. I, I was, I was shy. Uh, I was glowing, like walking around. <laughs> You're gorgeous, baby. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm, I'm a big advocate. So, so this is what I'd say to people, because people would inevitably be like, "Oh, paleo, like." You're trying to eat like a caveman, that's stupid. They'd say things like, did you know, you know bro you're eating broccoli. Broccoli's an invention of the last couple of hundred years. Yeah, or like, sell out. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, the cavemen ate that, that you don't eat or this and that. And I'd be like, look, it's not, I'm not ideologic. I'm not a purist about it. Like I'm not literally trying to eat like a paleolithic person. I just use it as a rule of thumb or a heuristic to filter out yeah. 
refined carbs, sugar, and processed crap, and then your which it, no one can really disagree with. I, I was going to say, do you think you felt better because you just cut out that that crappy stuff? The, I think that was rather 90, than what you ate. Ninety five percent of it, and whether you call it paleo or anti inflammatory or whatever you want to call it, low carb um, is another term yeah. people often use. Um, essentially, it's that formula. Yeah, just that, stuff that, that isn't processed, formula. right? Yeah, and a lot of the expert opinion is actually mobilizing behind this way of eating now as well. I will say. Um, people like dr Rhonda patrick get around it um she she's great um and i think everyone needs to to get on this bandwagon but it's just a shame that like the freaking mainstream media kind of like i think 95 percent of what you say is just 100 percent beneficial to society maybe even more 99 <laughs> and it's a shame that those headlines kind of distract from that message they don't distract anything to do with me do you think though it does you might you have you have a good message to share so whether you like it or not if if what you're saying is true then it's worth telling people about it right so do you think you might do yourself a bit of a disservice by allowing it to be spun like with these crazy headlines that you don't wear sunscreen and all this sort of stuff? Like, I'm not in control of anything that anyone writes about me. So You're so zen, Ben. Very zen. <laughs> I love it. But it, uh, going back to what you said, Joe, is that a lot of people um, were having a go at you or a lot of people would uh, – uh, no one could argue with getting rid of – the refined sugars of this and mm. again what does it matter what anyone thinks yeah joe why are you so well i just i want i enjoy the you know the the rigors of debate but i wanted to kind of why? bring everyone on this band i i, I think it, it's it's uh, arguing i think that there's such a thing as objective truth and you want to as you were saying earlier you want to get to what works fundamentally and well, then you want to try and bring as many people along with that as possible to help other people well there's only one truth really is that it's all just energy. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, well, so I thought you were going to say all men are created equal. <laughs> no. Well, the, the truth Amen, is it, there's only energy. And uh, once you understand that or uh, have an experience to, to delve a little bit deeper into that, and um, then nothing's right or nothing's wrong. It's just we all have one life here, right now, what are you going to do? And personally, I don't really, it doesn't affect me what anybody else thinks of me or potentially what I think of anybody else because it's, it's only happening now. There's a, there's a wonderful book, again, I'll, I'll suggest a book for people to read. If Love they it, want we're to, always open to books. There's a great book called uh, Being Human by a fellow called Martin W. Ball. And uh, I've actually had him on the podcast talking about this. And it's about how have we developed our characters or identity from birth to be the people that we are now. And once you start to recognise your patterns and your belief systems and where they've come from. And probably a good, good uh, mirror for that book is Rudy's book, The Truth and Love and Fear, is that none of that, none of this matters. None of what anyone writes about me or paleo or suggests about paleo, none of that matters at the end of the day because it comes down to you, you're accountable for your own choices and decisions and what are you going to do? You know, people talk about purpose and I don't think there is a purpose. I just think you have this one experience. How do you want to live it? So, you know, do you want to live in fear or do you want to live in, in, in a space of positive intent for yourself that uh, you're not going to get caught up in illusion? Because what you're talking about there is sort of illusionary. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think life doesn't have an ultimate meaning. We, we each ma make, get to make our own meaning in the brief time we have here. But do you agree with that? Like, what's your, what's your mission? 
to keep breathing for as long as possible, to not suffer any of the, I guess, the modern day illnesses, whether it be Alzheimer's, dementia, diabetes, autoimmune issues, uh, to be experience this life to the fullest, to be able to go out on the surf for as long as I can, to watch my kids grow up, see their grandkids, if they choose to have kids. Um, <laughs> no, no pressure. How old are they? Uh, they're 13 and 11. Okay, they've got a bit of time then, yeah. <laughs> it's, again, it's up to them what they choose <laughs> to do. And um, there's no rules. And, and to, exp- to watch this wonderful moment unfold for as long as I'm around for, and that is the evolution of the planet, the universe, our species, other species, and, and actually have a enjoy that. But sh- surely you want to bring as many people along as possible on this journey. Otherwise, mm. why write, write books and do a podcast and talk about the benefits of anti Because I'm, I think each and every one of us, I, I guess when you said we don't have a meaning, each and every one of us has we things. We create our own meaning. Well, each and every one of us has things that we like to do. For me, I love to create. Um, I love conceptualizing ideas. I love to be able to, that excites me. Is That's why I'm here today, is to have a chat to you guys. You guys asked me, I was like, yep, that excites me. I'll, I'll come and have a chat. Has and it been exciting? So far, so good. Awesome. <laughs> and, um, but, so the documentary, it came about because I was like, I would like to make a documentary. I feel like this is a story that I feel like I can share and it's something that I'm passionate about. So we all have our passions and our preferences and what we want to do in life. And I have no idea whether it'll reach 1% of the population, 5% of the population, 10 people. It's, I have no expectations on where it's going to go. I have no expectations on where this podcast is going to go. And once you remove your expectations, then you won't be let down then you'll just be amazed at how things unfold. And, for instance, this one podcast, who knows, five years down the track, ten years down the track, someone might bump into me and go, hey, listen, I listened to the podcast that you guys did. And uh, it was cool. I'll be like, sweet. Was, uh, will, you be, will you be feel happy? I'm always happy. It's, but, it's, okay. okay. But, like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work out so like, like, is, is there a is there a long term goal there? I guess. But well, like, do you age, do you want do you want to make other people's lives better, or are you? That's up is to that them. Just, is that just a very happy byproduct of your creative process? That's up to them. I again, if you remove your expectations of what you expect other people to do or, or have from your choices, then you'll never be disappointed. Or you'll, it's 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 a it's a very simple way. A friend of mine is uh, Trevor Hendy, seven-time Ironman champion. And uh, he'd be a good one for you to have a chat to if you, if you want to get into this a lot deeper than what I do. And uh, he's one of my friends and, and uh, mentors. And he talks about this and uh, um, expect nothing, you know. And there's, there's nothing's promised, Okay. And this is where people get fall into stress and anxiety and depression and this and that. When, when they have a, an expectation on something mm. or they believe it's going to happen. Whereas sometimes it's better to be surprised, I, I find, and not be attached to the outcome. Yeah. You're a Zen master, Pete Evans. No, I don't know. <laughs> I, <wouldn't laughs> but I do agree with that. So one of the, one of the best definitions of happiness I've, I've ever heard is it's the expectation reality gap. But like you were just saying, one of the best examples of that is when people go traveling or maybe you might recognize this in your own travel experiences, but often the happiest experiences you have are those surprises off the beaten path. Yeah. But when you go to the famous sites, when you go to the Eiffel Tower or the Coliseum, you always have that kind of disappointment in the back of your mind. And the reason is the postcards and the travel shows on TV and the all the images you see before you go build up this expectation in your mind and reality inevitably falls short. But if you stumble into an awesome little site or cafe or temple or whatever off the beaten path, you had zero expectations, reality beats them mm. and, and you're a lot happier. As I said to my daughter yesterday, we had a surf and it looked, it was terrible out there. We were up on the Gold Coast and uh, onshore winds 
And uh, I said to her, I said, let's go out for a paddle. She goes, oh, it looks terrible. I said, yep. I said, but you never know. I said, you might get the wave of your life. I said, you just never know. I said, but don't hold any expectations that it's going to be bad. Just let's go out there and, and see what happens, you know. And uh, that's, I guess, how you can view life, if you like. And, um, you know, long term, I don't know what, what, what's going to unfold. All I know is that I have ideas and concepts and if they feel like something that feels good for me and that I want to put out there, uh, then generally I'll follow that instinct or that, that desire or that passion um, to go out there and do it. Uh, we're putting together a, a new concept for a documentary at the moment, which um, will be very new and, and very, very different from what I've done in the past, uh, but it feels right. And it feels like something that I want to share. So it's, uh, and it's about this. It's about um, removing fear. And it's about living in the moment and 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 having trust in yourself. As um, we're born into this world with unconditional love, trust, and acceptance, and it's something that we quickly learn to to lose as we grow up. And it's about how do we tap back into that unconditional love, trust and acceptance that everything's perfect, there's nothing that needs to be changed, and that all we have is this moment. Was, um, was there a catalyst for this sort of change in life, life view? Did something happen or did you read something or meet someone that made you change this, this outlook? I think we're always... Uh, having different thoughts on, on how we want to live our lives, for sure, I think even early on, you know, and, and we develop strategies as to how to navigate family life growing up, how to navigate school life, you know, whether there's bullies, whether, whether it's academic, whether it's uh, relationships with friends or, or the um, romantic relationships. We're always looking at how to... How do we navigate this world? Because generally, we're not really taught these things from our parents. We're not really taught it through mainstream media uh, channels. Our current affair is pretty informative. Mate. We're <laughs> not really taught these things through, unfortunately, through religion. Yeah. Um, you know, because a lot of so, religion is based in fear and, and duality. So we, we, we go through our lives with without a great blueprint so to speak of of how to how to deal with our emotional well-being how to deal with learning life skills that will benefit us so do so, you always like this yeah is, is it something that you discovered by yourself or was there a moment that made you think shit i need to rethink how i'm doing this because there was there was a time when you were you know you were setting hugo's setting Hugo's up, rocking it around the city, yeah. you know, like... I'm sure you're going out, partying. Going out, like, partying. Yeah, I've had a... I've had Bad a, boy. I've, I've had a, uh, a wonderful experience so far through this life and it's taught me many lessons and um, I have experienced many things and uh, as we all have. Uh, is, was there a moment? I think it's always unfolding. I don't think there was a, a, a moment where I said, this is it. I mean, for instance... My decision to become a chef was through a strategic opportunity as to how do I get myself out of living from home. I want to live out of home to experience what it's like to be a young adult without any influence from my parents. How old were you? 17. And, uh, and that was the... And I chose chefing because... For me, it was the most common sense choice of a trade to have because I had no passion for anything, whether it was electrician, hairdresser, butcher, plumber, builder, uh, mechanic. And then you look at cooking and you go, well, maybe if I learn how to do that, that can benefit me for the rest of my life because I'll always be able to cook for myself, even if I just do the apprenticeship, which was always the goal. Learn, how, learn a trade three, four years, learn how to cook. I'll always be able to get a job, but... My first goal, my first priority was how do I get out of home? Because I didn't want to live at home anymore. Get a job. 
So, and we all have these strategies in us or these concepts or ideas of what we want in our lives. And at that point in time, that was my biggest priority. Let's get out of home. Okay, well, if I've got to get out of home, what's the best choice that I can make at this particular time with my skill set? Let's learn an apprentice. Let's do a trade. And from that, then once I started it, I was like, okay, well, let's have a look at the people that I'm working with here at this particular point in time. Do I, after three or four years, I'm at a skill level now where I can learn something else or I can continue in this path and maybe edge my way up um, in the rankings. Did you have this, I'm going to call it a Zen philosophy, did you have this sort of Zen philosophy back then or were you just living sort of day to day? Well, well, I think we all have the idea of how do we get what we want at this particular time and then once we choose to reword that differently as in, you know, what benefits us the best at this particular point in time. So we've always had that of, of personal growth. I mean, you guys have had it to set up your podcast. There'll be a reason for the two of you coming together and, and wanting to interview me today and the other people that you've had in the past, whether this is a stepping stone to something else for you guys or, you know, whether this is what you want to do, you know, and only you two can answer that and you guys are in a partnership here and you might have very different op opinions on where you both want to do which will be interesting to see what, what unfolds over the coming years. Stay tuned next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I need to have a word you yeah. this. Um, But that's, that's a relationship. Mm. Yeah. And well, your main priority was to learn how to feed yourself. Mm -hmm. What's your number one priority right now? Having fun and being a, just trying to live in the moment and without fear. You know, I think stress is one of our biggest hurdles in modern day life. What sort of things stress you out? Stress, I guess, stress like anyone else in this day and age would be, you know, if you're a parent, is how are your kids coming up? Uh, are you a good responsible role model for them? Uh, are they getting the education they need? Are they getting the life skills they need? Are they uh, inheriting my bad um, belief systems or their pa or their other family members' belief yeah, systems. Like paleo? What's that? Like paleo. Paleo is not no, a belief joking, system. Joking. But, um, <laughs> um, Haven't you not been listening? <laughs> <laughs> but that, I guess that's one thing and I have to trust and accept that, that their journey is, is, is as it's meant to be and it's unfolding as it's meant to be. Um, other fears is, you know, the state of the world at the moment. Where is it heading? How long is this can I keep going? What's the deal with the, the politicians that are in? And again, you have to come back and have trust and, and acceptance that this is unfolding as it's meant to be unfolding and everything is in balance. And I, I witnessed it last year or a year and a half ago with, say, Donald Trump coming into power. <clears throat> there was so much negativity around the workplace. I'd go into work and everyone would be talking about it. Even last week I went into work and uh, people were still talking about it. And I was like, how is this affecting your life? Hmm. A year and a half ago, people were talking about it all day. They were getting angry. Hmm. They were getting upset. They were getting stressed. I was like, and I said to someone, I said, how is that affecting you personally? Because he's in power for four years. Hmm. Well, a lot, of or, people, a lot of people don't realize, but they're actually very, people can be very addicted to negative emotions. Even though negative emotions are, are a bad thing, they feel bad, people can actually be quite addicted to that feeling. How because do they you... like to be in fear. Pardon? Because they potentially like to be in fear mm. or, or have that belief system set up that uh, nothing can be perfect. So it's, a, it's about having that trust and acceptance and self-love and, and knowing that what we have is right now and how to, how to flow with that as best as possible. Do you, go, going back to when um, some elements of the mainstream media kind of rip on different comments you make and take them out of context, do you have the view that any press is good press? Well, it depends who's reading it. That's a very zen answer, we can. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's, it depends. I mean... I don't know how many people read mainstream media these days. So, Do you see a difference between fame and infamy? 
define what that means. Well, like, do, do you, would you rather fame or infamy? Would you rather, would you rather be known as the controversial Paleo Pete guy or be well known for, but be, be less well known for living like a healthy life? I don't mind if I'm known or, <laughs> or well known at that. Mm. That's, but there, there must be like, um, I mean, you're a, a clever guy and have had much success in the the cooking chefing industry there comes a point where you got to have a, a commercial strategy or a, i mean you you have to you have to earn a crust right you have to be able to sell cookbooks or get people to come to your restaurant or something whatever however it is you make money and being infamous might make that easier or more successful i'd, I'd go back to your not, state- we're, not, we're not saying you're infamous, by the way. No, it's just more of a, <laughs> no, it's it's a just philosophical re- idea. It reminds yeah, me of the, yeah. the three amigos, we're the infamous El Guapo. But, um, <laughs> but going back to your question or your statement about success is, is how do you define success? Because each and every one of us defines success very differently. You know, success for some is being free of worrying thoughts. Success for others is to be famous. Uh, success for others is to have a certain amount of money in their bank account. Success for others is to have a loving relationship with their husband, wife, or partner. Success for others is having a very close relationship with their children. Um, success for others is, is whatever, and it can be a, a multifaceted approach to what you view as success. And, you know, for success for me is, um, number one, being able to receive and give love and number two being healthy to also experience all that life has to offer uh, if you're talking about financial success then I don't know whether there is such a thing uh, because you look at some of the wealthiest people in the world and there's you know re- just recently you've seen one of our um, our people have mental health breakdown over certain things, you know, and not all the money in the world can, can solve that. James Parker. But um, certain, you know, do I like putting things out there into the world that, um, that generate money so that I can take my family on a holiday like we're going next week to Fiji? Sure. It's, uh, it's fantastic, especially if you're putting things out there into the world. I mean, this is just my, I guess philosophy is if you're putting things out there that actually benefit people like you guys are doing with this podcast you know well that's a tick if you're putting things out there into the world that may be detrimental to people then you know that's a choice that you have to make but luckily at this particular point in time I'm sharing recipes I'm sharing documentaries I'm sharing uh, different food products that are out there that um, should lead people to be healthier and happier and but again, that's, uh, I have no expectations on that. <laughs> For people who want to join you on the anti-inflammatory or paleo or whatever you would like to call it, diet. Yep. For people who are starting out, what are some of the common mistakes that people make? Uh, I don't know about what mistakes they make. but Or um, foods they think might be healthy or permissible but actually aren't Just inflame, inflame the shit out of you. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Set you on fire. Yeah. Boom. I, I always suggest people read. Anyone wanting to change their diet, I think, should potentially fuel themselves or fuel their minds with the understanding of why, first and foremost. Before, we set up a uh, 10-week program a few years ago, which took people through the process of, of all the information that um, I could put into a 10-week program as to why this works. And my common response to people was, forget about the food, just watch every interview and read every article that's in this program or read Nora's book or other people's books on this topic. And once you've taken in the information and it feels right for you, that what you've read makes sense, then potentially go on and change your diet. And you can change it as, as quickly or as, as slowly as you choose to. There's no right or wrong because you're totally responsible for your own actions. Mm. So once you have that information, then go for it. If you have addictive natures to certain foods or alcohol or drugs, um, 
or other vices, then you might want to read a book like uh, A Mind of Your Own by psychiatrist Dr. Kelly Brogan, who's also on my podcast. And uh, you might get some wealth of information there about how our minds work. Um, or there's different therapists that operate around the world that you can either do their programs or go and visit and have a one-on-one -on -one session that can help you understand why certain decisions that you're making potentially aren't giving you the results that you want, whether it is addiction to cigarettes, alcohol, sex, whatever it may be, uh, that you want to improve. I'm, I'm surprised by how sort of open-ended your answers are because I was expecting you to be very like... This is what you should eat. Like, here's my, here's my menu. See that muffin? Get it out of here. <laughs> you've been very philosophical today. Well, I don't know where you've got your information from about me, but... Uh, Mainstream, a current affair, that sort of thing. That, all, that, the, all, all the, all the heart-heating journos. <laughs> maybe, maybe a better way to ask is this. Like, what do you eat? Like, do you... So, for example, people might think that legumes are okay to eat, but there's actually an argument within the paleo community that they're quite inflammatory. So that's everything from beans up to and yeah. including peanuts as well. So do you eat legumes and peanuts? No. Okay, cool. It's, I'm not going to eat them. Is that because it's... In, <laughs> I've got some in my bag. I'm going to throw them out. Is that because they're, exactly they're inflammatory? We just don't like yeah. them? Yeah. Yeah, okay. What, what's, do, do you have a guilty pleasure? Like, is a Big Mac something you just love to chow down on? Like, what's, your, so. what's your thing? Caviar. My thing, as I've said before, is that I eat better now than I ever have. The food that I eat now is more delicious than anything that I've ever eaten in the I mean, past. I mean, something that isn't, that might be really inflammatory and you just love it. You can't say no. Is there anything like... Well, well, you are very famous for pizza with Hugo's. Yeah. It was like last night I took my daughters out for a dinner because we got home late and we flew, flew in and we had um, went down to North Bondi Fish because they live around the corner. And we got a plate of oysters, you know, and for me there is no better food in the world as far as taste mm. goes than a plate of oysters. And my youngest one is up to three or four in a session and my oldest one, uh, she's not into them yet, but she had one last night and she still didn't like it. But, um, but it was a great achievement for her because she hasn't had one for a couple of years. And then I got a whole fish head that was to die for. Uh, we had a fish curry there that they cooked. Uh, we got some veggies on the side. I tell you what, it was it was it was a sensational dinner. Are you are you worried that there's you know sugar or MSG or anything in the curry? Do you check beforehand? No. We should say Matt Moran, former former guest, former friend of the pod. Fr he's a friend of the pod. Current yeah, friend of the pod. yeah, that's right. It, but <laughs> sensational restaurant it was so good. So yeah, so I mean. You still allow yourself to go out to a restaurant and have a good meal. It doesn't matter if it's if there are legumes in the in the curry or anything like that, right? There wasn't, but uh, I choose for. There's always options on every single menu, yeah. And generally, they're the best options too. Mm. So if you think about a plate of food, so if I cooked you a pasta, for instance, with no sauce, you'd think it was pretty tasteless, right? Yeah. If I made you a sandwich with nothing in it. No bread. I mean, no, no filling. You'd think it was pretty boring. If I cooked you a bowl of rice to go with that curry and all you could eat was that rice, you would think it was pretty boring. If I boiled you up some chickpeas, you'd go, yeah, this is pretty boring. So we have the most boring foods on the face of the planet being consumed the most that are actually inflammatory for us have no nutritional value whatsoever, basically, and have no flavor. Mm. No flavor at all. So from a chef's point of view, once you remove those bland, boring, beige foods from your diet, you are left with a celebration of flavor. So going back to what I said is the food that I eat now is more delicious than anything I've ever eaten in the past as a whole because you're taking away the, the flavor robbers from the plate. So you are left with, you know, for instance, the oyster is the perfect food. You shuck it, you put it down the hatch, it doesn't need anything, doesn't need lemon, doesn't need salt, doesn't need anything. Now, you would be hard pressed to find someone walking through a wheat field or a rice field or a chickpea field and go, Fuck, that looks delicious. Mm. 
they just wouldn't. Whereas if you were in a, a farm, there would be strawberries, there would be berries, there would be tomatoes, there'd be cucumbers growing, there'd be carrots under the ground. Even we can eat raw meat, for mm. instance. You watch The Revenant, you know, with Leonardo DiCaprio. They're eating the raw stuff. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's in our nature to be attracted to those foods that serve us. It's just that once you have been brought up on foods from a young age that are bland, that are sugary, that our addiction to those foods becomes pretty full on. Did you put that really nice little tomato sauce, sort of spicy sauce on the oysters? I had some last week and it came out with this little tomato we sort of No, spicy. because I didn't, actually didn't like that. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> they used to do a better one. Oh, okay. that, that new gotcha. one's not, not great. Sorry, Maddie. <laughs> In Sapiens. Have you heard of the book Sapiens by Yuval Harari? No, I haven't. Uh, we, we talk about it every episode or two. Yeah. <laughs> but in Sapiens, the author talks about how if you really think about it, we didn't, Homo sapiens as a species didn't cultivate wheat. Wheat domesticated us. Yep. And it was the genius of this, this plant because before cunning, then cunning humans plant, were free-ranging and hunting and gathering. But then in order to farm wheat, we had to settle down in permanent farms and agricultural settlements and start planting crops of this stuff. And it totally changed our you existence. You got to spend all this time building the mill. You got to add the sand and, if you're and Roman. Wheat, and wheat yeah. was suddenly being perpetuated throughout the world. Yeah. I, I will say though, I mean, sadly, in many parts of the developing world, these... Um, it's kind of like a necessary evil, isn't well, it? Well, yeah, these quite quite drab um, carbs are very cheap and very calorie dense and a lot of people don't, don't really have the choice. But if we do have the choice and we're, we're fortunate enough to have the choice in a country like Australia, then we should be, we should be eating what, what do you eat, Pete? No, oh, that's a choice for you. <laughs> I'm never going to say people should be eating anything, but, if, but going back to uh, what you were just saying is if we're thinking about the health of the planet, then yes, we should be eating this way, 1,000%. If we want a better future for, for this planet, for the inhabitants of it, then yes, this would be the most common sense way to eat because it is it is healing for the planet mm. you need to if you want to learn more then check out alan savory's work from the savory institute and also joel salatin's work from polyface farms and from those two sources uh, they will take you on a very educational journey as to how we can heal our planet very quickly and also feed people yeah properly we'll look into that. i mean that's a huge huge conversation um but no that's that's a good recommendation we can link to the presenting sponsor of the jelly swagman podcast is globite in between cooking your 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 beef and uh not eating your legumes head to the website globite.com use the discount code swagman and you're going to get 15% off all travel products. So good. Head to the website and just remember with Globite, you go, we go. Back to the show. For, for people following along at home who, who've been inspired by this, what, what would like an average day look like for you diet-wise? What are a few, a few easy meals yeah. that if they chose to, they might also eat? Sure. Just, uh, yeah, to take us through it, pump us out a day of food. Sure. So it can be anything. So, for instance, with the kids yesterday, we took them for a surf. Uh, they eat more. Kids need to eat more, uh, more regularly, usually three meals a day. Um, but I think I only did two with them yesterday. But um, we had a, a lunch, basically, at about 11 o'clock. Um, uh, they had a, uh, one of my collagen smoothies to start with uh, before the surf, which was just a cup. And then when we came back, we what had... Do you, what do you put in the smoothie? Collagen smoothie, uh, avocado. We have some collagen powder, coconut cream, basically raw egg. Um, and then for lunch, we had some leftover pate. We always eat pate every week, uh, which is chicken liver. 
which uh, going back to the work of Western A. Price is fundamental for us. Um, next to that, we had some avocado or guacamole my wife made, which is good, the good fats. We had an omelette that I made. We had greens from the garden and some fermented veg on there as well. And my wife had made a seed bread. Um, it was hemp seed bread that we had with the avocado and also the pate. And, and then last night we Are you cooking had, with, sorry, are you cooking with olive oil or coconut oil? Uh, coconut oil and yeah. dressing salads with olive oil and stuff like that. Okay. So, And uh, the, the bread, is that grainy? Is that bad? No grains. No? Okay. Hemp and seed. Oil. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but that was just leftovers from yesterday. But generally, for instance, with the kids, it'll be eggs with some sort of meat and vegetables for breakfast and some fermented foods and a little bit of fruit. Then they'll have a lunch. It might be some sort of meatballs or snags with some raw fruit and veggies. And then for dinner, it'll be, whether it be a soup or a, a, a roast or anything like that, pretty basic stuff. So, same with me. Yeah. So really simple. It could be a barbecue, salad and veggies with a piece of meat or seafood. What else? Like bacon? Bacon. If you can get free range, then... Is, it, is, it, is bacon pro heavily processed or no. salted or anything like that? No. Well, salt is fundamental for us. So, again, you go and check what salt they're using. Do you want grass-fed bacon? You, there's no such thing, but there's pasteurized okay. bacon or free-range oh, bacon. Pigs don't eat grass, do they? Pigs don't. Well, they can eat. Um, they're omnivores. They're like chickens yeah. and us. Yeah. <laughs> they can eat a yeah. lot of stuff. But uh, generally, they're fed um, uh, grain mm -hmm. like chickens are. So you wouldn't be touching dairy? No. Nope. What about yeah. like unpasteurized milk? Just straight out of the udder. Don't touch dairy. No, no dairy. Cool. No. no grains, no sugar, no processed crap. What about like coffee? Do you have coffee? Uh, occasionally we have a cold brew organic coffee. Yeah. But um, And we have tea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. Butcher and kefir and things like that. So lots of eggs, good protein. Yeah, we've got healthy. chickens that lay our eggs, which is pretty oh, cool. Perfect. Down at the farm. Yeah. yeah. But again, plate of vegetables with a side of meat or seafood. Mm-hmm. Simple you as that. steaming them or in the pan? Or? However you want. Roast, steam, yeah, cool. fry, raw. Mm. What's like a go-to dinner or lunch that, that you, can, you can whip up pretty quickly if you're not using leftovers? Simple, like um, steamed fish with some vegetables yeah. cooked in fat, however you want to do it. Oh, what, what, sort of, what sort of vegetables? Whatever's in season. Yeah. Mixture. Just, yeah. Broccoli, anything. Anything you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, okay. So final five. Uh, what is one thing that you hold to be true that the rest of society disagrees with you on? I'm sure we can list many here. Let's just pick the number one. Ah, uh, well, that uh, we're all infinite beings of energy. That um, you know, that's there's no such thing as separation. Second question, what is the last thing you do at night and the first thing you do in the morning? First thing I do in the morning, wow. <laughs> Open my eyes and uh, I guess close my eyes at the night time. <laughs> it's a very technical answer. Yeah, I like from it. From a Zen master. <laughs> the worst piece of career advice you've ever received? Uh, that to make it, you have to work hard. What's one habit that you've improved about yourself in the last six to 12 months? Um, and habit that I've improved. Um, me being more present. Nice. Says, been... says me who's rushing out to get yeah. his daughter from school because <laughs> I'm going to miss her. And uh, final message for the audience that you want to leave them with. Um, final message for everyone. Uh, cook with love and laughter if that's uh, what you enjoy. Cool. Pete Evans, thanks for joining us. Cheers, guys. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, man. We hope you enjoyed our chat with Chef Pete Evans. Please head to our website, thejollyswagman.com, for links to all the plethora of books and podcasts that Pete mentioned. And uh, I am off to the US for a month. Yes, I bid you adieu. Oh, we will be meeting up in New York. In New York. See you in Times Square, baby, under the big, uh, the big grandstand. That's right. And about six guests lined up in America. Very yeah. exciting interviews. So... The listeners have a lot to look forward to. We'll see you next week. And uh, don't forget, rate and review on iTunes as always. Until then, I'm Joe. And you're Angus. Bye. <laughs>